Well, Berkeley in its beginnings is, is, remember this was part of the Northwest Territories, but people forget about the American Revolution. This was all British territory. And everybody remembers the original 13 states, but when we won the war against England and we got an independence, we got all of this land of what became Michigan, Ohio, Indiana. One of the first things the government did was they wanted some money. They wanted to sell off this land. So they decided they'll sell off this land at about $1.25 an acre. So they sent surveyors out here to look all over to see what was land would be decent for farming, what they could sell, what they couldn't sell. And the first people that came to this area said, you can't sell this land, it's just no good. It's wet sometimes and the soil's not that good. And the equivalent of the boosters of that period didn't like that. So they got somebody else to resurvey it and surprise, surprise, all of a sudden the land's good enough to sell now. So the first real settlers hit what becomes Berkeley around the 1830s. And uh, the Elwood family, the Blackman family, all of those. And, and they were farmers. And Berkeley, of course, is in between what became Detroit and Pontiac, so we're on that straight path. So even if the land wasn't very good, it was probably going to be built up anyways just because it was between those two big cities. So slowly it becomes farms and they sell the stuff they make into Detroit and Pontiac. There were dairy farms, apple farms, we've got a picture of people doing potato farming. And then what really starts Berkeley off is the Henry Ford plant and Highland Park opens not that far from us and then they put in the rapid transit system of the day, the, 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 the trolleys of the day. So we're right on the trolley stop so as the employees start being hired at the factories they start buying houses in what becomes Berkeley, the farms get sold off. By the 1920s the farms are pretty much gone and now we're a city and so it all gets subdivided. So Berkeley begins to slowly fi uh, fill up, but we're, we are part of Royal Oak Township. And in 1923, what happens is people living around here, they begin to be afraid that they're gonna be annexed by the big city of Royal Oak. And that's the last thing they, they want. And this is partly due to of taxes, you know, so much is due to money. So a group of people from the International Order of the Odd Fellows, goes to Pontiac and gets the paperwork to make us a village. And there's a vote and then Berkeley becomes the village of Berkeley in 1923. And then years go by and it does become the city of Berkeley in 1932. But Berkeley slowly fills up and it, it becomes somewhat of a boom time. And, uh, but then the depression hits and Berkeley is severely hit by the Great Depression in the 1930s. Not only does everybody lose their job, but one newspaper article says that 90% of the city is now in foreclosure. There was a bank right on the corner of 12 Mile and the Street Berkeley. The building is still there, it was the Berkeley State Bank. Everybody in Berkeley had their money in the bank, the city had their money in the bank, and the bank goes under like so many banks did in the 1930s. So, I mean, 1930s were a very, very rough time. But slowly we come out, and of course, then the war comes. The World War II is just a major thing, of course. Then right after the war is the true boom period of Berkeley. Around 1940, 41, and then on is when Berkeley fills up as they build all of what people still affectionately call the Berkeley bungalows. These nice little two-story house, three bedroom, one bathroom. That's what so many of us grew up in. If you look at an aerial photo of Berkeley in 1940, what you're gonna notice is that it's mostly empty. There are some houses built in the 20s and 30s, but you can look down block after block and it's just empty. You go back and look at an aerial photo taken from the exact same spot 10 years later and Berkeley is full. It is one house after another. They are going up as fast as they can dig the basements and pour the concrete. With the explosion in population, the stores follow. And this is, becomes the classic period of Berkeley downtown. If you think of downtown 12 Mile, which was our main shopping strip, 
And within a few years, starting in the 40s and early 50s, we get the Berkeley Theater in 1941, which is probably still the most recognizable building in the city. You get Kresge's Dime Store, you get Cunningham's, you get Nellie Davis, you get uh, uh, beer stores and meat stores. And it's hard for people to believe it now, but you could do all of your shopping on downtown 12 Mile. So this is really the classic time in Berkeley, and this is the time that most people who grew up here remember with so much fondness. But Berkeley continues to boom and other stores move in, and to this day we're still seeing stores come and go, and I suspect it will always be that way. During World War II, this was a community that came together. Of course, we had paper drives. I can remember being a child. And we would collect the newspapers and take them to school, and you'd weigh, they'd weigh them, and that was turned in, and you got stripes if you turned in so many pounds of paper. We'd take tin cans, and then as kids, it was our job to step on them and flatten them because they would send the tin back in to be reused or possibly used for the war relief. And I can remember being in school when they started dropping the atomic bomb and things like that. We would have drills where we would have to duck and cover. We also had a lot of rationing. Everything from sugar, butter, cigarettes, everything was rationed. Uh, tires, rubber. But it was a time where everybody pulled together. I remember the people that lived across the street he was drafted and he was in the service and his wife was trying to live on their allotment check. We kind of adopted the family. World War II is just a major thing, of course. And uh, there's a, 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 a classic photo of right next to where we're sitting in this building, there was, they put up a big board where they put the names of every boy from Berkeley who's off fighting in the war. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names there. And every one 17, 18, 19 year old boy, and this of course was happening all across the country. And that was pretty much the way the whole community gathered together. And it's a, it's a feeling that you have in Berkeley even today. People support each other. And if you've got a problem, your neighbors will be there to help you. My earliest memories of Berkeley and being in this area, on my sixth birthday in 1943, we moved to Princeton in one of those small bungalows. Um, I grew up in that home. We stayed there till I was 18. But the things I remember about living on Princeton, we had unpaved roads. They were dirt roads. When it would rain in Berkeley every spring, we would row boats down the street because we've always had a water problem. And then years later, they put in the 12-town drain, and that improved a lot of that. But Berkeley was a wonderful place to grow up. I grew up in Berkeley. When my parents brought me home, they brought me home to 4219 Buckingham. I lived there from 1951 till I went to be a flight attendant for 40 years. 
to uh, 1972. We were a few houses away from Webster and that's before uh, there was a Beaumont parking lot and it was just woods and all the the men and women, the moms and dads, will go down and pay, play horseshoes. Some of the businesses that I remember growing up in Berkeley was when we would leave La Salette, we would have a little bit of money, we'd stop at the Tasty Freeze. After the football games, we would go to uh, Domenico's for pizza. I worked at Brown's Creamy for, Creamery for a while, and then Tip Top from 16 till I was 21. I remember also going to see uh, movies like Sound of Music with my mother and we would walk up to the Berkeley Theater and the, the, the fond memories that I have with my mom. And um, so it's not just the movie but it's the fond memories I have with my parents. My dad would took his, take his car to Vincetta's garage. Many of my fond memories of Berkeley and I'm glad Berkeley is doing so well. One of my favorite memories is actually going to this local diner that um, was in Berkeley called Nip and Tuck. And it was just a fun little cute diner and sometimes you had a space to sit, sometimes you really didn't. Some other places that I used to go to a time is um, bowling, bowling in Berkeley um, in Hartfield Lanes. I, I do remember the Hardys. There's an argument with my father that I might not remember it, but I remember going to Hardy's. One thing that I um, do recall from Berkeley is that, um, so my grandma used to own a building. It's actually where my parents got married, but they turned the building into one of my favorite stores called Catching Fireflies. And um, it's a store that I still go to to this day. I take my son there on the weekends, and we just like to look at all the knickknacks and um, buy a little treat here and there. Berkeley is not just a place for me. It's, it's a feeling. It's a feeling of home, um, something that I feel like I just always keep coming back to. I think that everybody in the city is familiar with Berkeley days, but probably you don't know how it began. And it's had different names, like at one time it was called Berkeley's Civic Holiday and Homecoming. Uh, and so it's been held at different times, different places. Uh, but now it's uh, a fixture on the weekend after Mother's Day. Uh, and for many years there was a parade uh, that there were uh, there were lots of participants and there were prizes for the best floats and the best bands. Uh, but uh, roughly a decade ago, that was suspended for a number of reasons. So the uh, event is kicked off by a 10K race, which is actually the second oldest in Michigan. Uh, for many years, there was uh, a contest for to crown Miss Berkeley. In 1971, when they had Berkeley Days, I uh, signed up to be in the pageant. There was about 20 of us girls. We had a, a mother-daughter tea the week before, and I was Miss Berkeley, 1971. It was such an honor to be chosen, and I have uh, I received a trophy. I still have my trophy. Uh, here we are at the corner of Coolidge and 12 Mile, and it's very a lot of traffic, the bustling, and we all take for granted that Coolidge goes all the way uh, out to Troy. But there was a time then back in 1926 where Coolidge ended right there at 12 Mile. At the time, Coolidge was called Monier and 12 Mile was called Oakwood. And the Roseland Park Cemetery over there used to extend out here. So that's why Coolidge ended there. Uh, but in 1926, cemetery sold off some of the land and uh, part of it became what is now St. John's Woods and Coolidge extended north. To celebrate the occasion, the city had a big parade and they called it Berkeley Days and that's how the tradition of Berkeley Days got started.
we have a question. What comes first, the city or the schools? Actually, you live in the Berkeley School District, but the Berkeley School District existed much before the city did. This whole area had school districts before they had towns and cities. And this was called the uh, school district number seven. So uh, that's why some people wonder why the Berkeley School District includes part of Oak Park and Huntington Woods and a little bit of Berkeley is actually in the Royal Oak School District. It's because those school district lines were drawn way before the lines of villages and cities were drawn. So here we are, they need schools even though there aren't any cities and there are a few people living around here. So one of the very, very first things they do is they, they build a school. 1835. Now Berkeley doesn't even exist until 1923. It stood right about at Coolidge and Catalpa, right across the street from where the high school is today. And it was a one-room schoolroom, so everybody attended, didn't matter how old you were, anything from kindergarten through high school would be in that one-room schoolhouse. It's called the Blackman Schoolhouse because Farmer Blackman gave them part of his potato patch to use to build a school. So eventually they outgrow that school and there's no water there. So the next school is built right about where Durst Hardware is now on 11 Mile Road. And that gets called the South School simply because it's south of the Blackman School. And that was a, a white school and it had a school bell on the top. And one of the things that we have in the museum that we are the most proud of is we have that school bell. It was used to call students to school and later uh, it was used to call the volunteer fire department. When they stopped using the school, it actually became a, a dormitory for the teachers that lived in this district. <laughs> Berkeley starts to, re to really grow and the, and the population begins to boom and Berkeley becomes in need of real schools with grades, not just one-room schoolhouses. So in 1919, they build the Berkeley School and it was right across the street from where the high school is today. Today you'll see some, some vacant land there used, used, used for practicing. And that's where Berkeley School was, and it went all the way from kindergarten through high school. And in the 1920s, they started building grade schools throughout the city. They built First Angel, which is still here in Berkeley, and it's actually the oldest school being used in Oakland County. They built Pattengill. During the Depression, uh, times hit so badly that they had to close many of the schools in Berkeley. They were boarded up, not used. And then after the Depression, they actually got a federal grant to restore the buildings and they were, they were open again. One of the events that happened in Berkeley, in what we call the Berkeley School was, in the 1960s, they had one of the first cyclotrons in any school in the country. And we became quite famous for this fact that Berkeley School, the high school students actually had a cyclotron in use in the basement of the school. And in 1980, they finally tore that school down because it had been used as a grade school after they built the high school in 1949. So. From uh, starting in 1949, they built the high school across the street, and that has just been added on to and grown and grown and grown over the years. And we do have, in the museum, we have a blackboard that comes from the 1919 school. And a lot of children today, of course, have never actually written with chalk on a blackboard. Besides the public schools in Berkeley, Berkeley had a, a Catholic grade school, Our Lady of La Salette Grade School. The building is still there on Coolidge at Harvard. Um, and it went from first grade through the eighth grade and it was closed just a few years ago and the bench here was a former pew from the church and it was kept in the principal's office and if you were sitting on the bench you knew your mother and father had been called and they were coming to get you because you had done something. Here's one of the first desks that was in the Berkeley Elementary School. These desks were used starting in the 1930s and they looked pretty similar to the ones still being used in the 50s when I was in grade school. The early schools were one-room schoolhouses and they had heat like this, so they didn't have water and they didn't have central heat. This would have had a, a chimney on it going up to the roof and they would have used wood or coal in here and this one-room schoolhouse would have been heated by 
just something like this. Moving on in time, here's a typical desk starting to be used. This is from Pattengill Grade School. This is from the 1960s and 70s. One thing that everybody that comes in the museum says, if there's one thing that we hear from almost every visitor, it is, what a great city to grow up in. I had a great time in Berkeley. When the Dream Crew started in 95, there was some people that were associated with the Berkeley Chamber of Commerce, and they were excited about it, and what they did was they put together a car parade, and they had about 100 cars or something like that. The thing about it is, is that the committee is committed to making this a family event, and it has been a family event, and we have really good turnout, we have really good participation from people. This is a huge event for the city of Berkeley. We range between somewhere between about 20,000 to about 30 or 40,000 people that come here. Some of them are Berkeley residents, but many of them are from outside the city, whether they're close or far. We have plenty of people that come. I've had people that register for the parade from California. We have a whole group of people that register from the parade that come year after year after year for as long as I can remember that come from Ontario. It's a whole car club. And what the criteria is, is that it has to be older. It has to be a 1979 or older. We don't take anything newer than 1979. The other big thing that we do is with that many people in the area for a festival, which they, with the Dream Crew is approximately a million people up and down Woodward and a lot of them are in our area, we have to have a lot of law enforcement, DPW and other service personnel to keep things going. So we decided a few years back, about 10 years back, that we need to feed all these people. They're coming in here and working. So we set up a mini Taste of Berkeley, where we got donations from a lot of the restaurants so that these people from out of town that are working with us can get a taste of what Berkeley is like. And it's worked out very well. We feed approximately 125 people. We start feeding at five o'clock, and by six o'clock we've got them briefed and they're on their way to their posts for the cruise fest. I have a lot of access to people during that day, during that time and I talk to a lot of people and by and large the biggest thing that I hear from everyone is is that this event on Friday night that happens at 6.30 every year is their, it's their event, it's the best thing that they look for. It's all about the cars and for an hour's time and we try and keep the parade to an hour, for an hour's time they get to go back, think in their memory, remember those things that they that they saw when they were younger or the ones that they had or the, they're interested in cars so they love looking at them and um, it's it's a it's a really neat event and for many many people it's the highlight of their summer If you should visit the Berkeley Historical Museum, you're going into the 1928 Village Hall building, actually. And on the first floor, right where the museum is, as you look around, you're going to be standing right where the fire trucks were. On this first floor was the fire department and the police department. 1928, when the building was open, all the city offices were on the second floor of this building. And as you can see, it is a long staircase. To this day, I wonder what they did with elderly people and handicapped people. And then in the 1950s, they built a new city hall, which is attached to this city hall. And you can wander back through a labyrinth of hallways here in the new city hall, which opened up in 1959. And then at that point, uh, the fire and the policemen stayed in this building. 
but they kind of could spread out. And so they kind of took over the second floor too. The firemen took over all of this area to, for their own purposes. And you'll notice even behind us is the kitchen where they could cook their own meals. Not long ago, a man came in, quite elderly now, and he remembers actually building all of that kitchen equipment in, the, in those cabinets back in the 1970s. This is where the firemen would sleep when they were on duty for 24 hours a day. And if there was a fire right here, is where the fire pole was. They now have a big board blocking the hole at the bottom, but this is where they would have slid down to answer the call for a fire. This room is important to us because this room is full of stuff that we just don't have room for inside the museum. This is all the things that we would like to be able to use. Right where I'm standing is where the first room that was used for city council meetings. So there was a wall there which has been taken down. So in the 1920s, 1930s, if you wanted to attend a city council meeting, you would walk into this room. And over to my left, you would find the room for the city manager, the assistant city manager. This creepy looking room is the original Berkeley vault. The metal doors are still here, and this is, uh, if you came off and you paid your taxes, uh, this is where they would store the money. And today it holds all kinds of old city records. As you wander through the halls, you're gonna come across two staff restrooms. They're interesting because they were built almost exactly where the original two Berkeley cells were. Berkeley was the first city in Oakland County to have its own cells, and these were almost closer to big cages than to cells, but they were located right where the restrooms are today. This building is solid as a rock and I'm sure Berkeley is going to protect it. It's, a, it's on the State Register of Historic Buildings. Nothing says Berkeley to the people who grew up here more than the Berkeley Theater. Generations after generations attended the Berkeley Theater. It's still the most prominent building on 12 Mile. Uh, built in 1941, an Art Deco masterpiece, and it was almost a city tragedy in 1993 when it finally closed. We have the original front doors. I remember walking through those front doors as a kid and paying 14 cents to see two movies, a continued movie, a preview, and a cartoon. We have also saved some of the chairs from the Berkeley Theater, and we have saved as much as possible all the historic gum stuck underneath the chairs. One of the things that we're very, very proud of is there were a series of light fixtures up and down the auditorium where you sat, where you watched the movie, and these were turned off just as the movie would start. We had a volunteer who rewired the sconce, and it is now lit for the first time since 1993, and it's on display in the Berkeley Historical Museum, and we are very proud to have it. We kind of like to honor our firemen and our police department. In 1983, the two were combined into public safety. And in this corner, we have a piece of the brass pole that the firemen actually slid down. We have a lot of amazing stories about this pole and the one that most of the children get a kick out of and adults is the fact that when Shorty Snyder, one of our firemen, slid down it, he caught his ear on the hole that the pole went by and almost tore his ear off. But being a dedicated fireman, he went on and fought the fire, and after the fire was put out, he then went to the hospital. We're very proud of our police and fire, and now our combined public safety department. One of the things we're most lucky to have in the Berkeley Historical Museum is the Neon B, which was part of the original marquee sign from the word Berkeley from the Berkeley Theater. We have a local resident, Danny Briggs, who was the original man who maintained the neon sign on the Berkeley Theater. And it's, it's truly a thing of beauty from that beautiful archi architecture of the, of the Art Deco movie theater. So we're pleased to have it. This particular area houses memorabilia that the Baker Drug Company, when they, had, when they closed their store, 
they donated this to us. Many people come in here and they're fascinated when they look at some of the things we have in the case. When we first were, do this medicine was donated to us, we had to have the police department make sure that we weren't having controlled substances on display in here. But we have many, many things that are way out of date today, like paragoric, nobody uses that, black tar soap, different things like that. People stand here and enjoy this. The Baker's Drug Store was located on the corner of 12 Mile and Kenmore. The building currently has just been revamped and reopened as the new location for Tootie and Tallulah's. Hi, Patty and Dan McCarty here with the McCarty team, Cobalt Banker, Wear Manual. We hope you enjoyed our mini series, and if you have not been to the Berkeley Museum, you have to get there today. It's a magical and wonderful place to visit.